Hi, Larry Wolf, WA2AY Paramus. Hi, Larry Wolf, WA2AY Paramus. Thanks for asking me here. Uh, this will include folks who newly just got their licenses and uh, you newly licensed? Two years. Oh, okay. So, uh, so uh, most most guys get involved and they're on VHF, UHF, and uh, they don't get involved with high frequency, 10 through 80, until later on. But the 10 through 80 is kind of unique because, well, we're working DX, etc. And one of the things people have gotten away from is if you're new ham, first thing you want to do is get your logbook. And if you make a contact and you put it in here, you write the word Greenland. Well, nobody on your block has taken a pencil and written the word Greenland on a piece of paper. You're only the only guy in the block who's done that. And then you go down here, Venezuela, El Salvador. By the time you do that, you start to become worldly without leaving your shack. So uh, about the uh, logbook, I recommend Mert number one, you put the year. Of course here, you put your radio, your antenna tuner, and how many antennas you got. Down here, you indicate what antenna you use. Because there's nothing worse than looking back at your log, you made a 20 meter contact, and you don't knew, know if you used the inverted L or your, or your beam. What fun is that? The other thing is you want to fill it all in. The instructions in the front of the book will mislead you. I'll leave it at that. So I would then pass this out so you can see one of the, and pass it around, and you can see how a log book theoretically should be filled out. In addition to that, we have this is how we know what freak guys been on VHF for who knows how long. I was the other way. I never heard pass right up. Pass down. Okay. I never I never heard of uh, two meters. I'm a ham for a year and I'm out at a, a, at a ham fest and I bought a two meter radio. And then in, and in, in today's, this month's uh, QST, we have a copy of this. When you do some stuff on the weekends, uh, Stu Perry and 160 meter stuff, Frank, Sound Key, my buddy Frank, we used to compare these how we did on the weekend. And that's a visual of how we did on the weekend. You can pass that down. The next thing you do, you don't need, you know, you get a new guy, you say, well, you need a computer, you need a, uh, you need a program to keep track of uh, the contacts you made. This is all you need. It's the DXCC list. And you can keep track of who you worked, if you got a card, and if you send it up to ARRL for credit. After you make the contact, Let's say you work Andorra, A-N-D-O-R-A. Nobody knows where Andorra is. But you have your World Atlas for amateur radio operators, and you can find Andorra. Well, so now you're down at the uh, local uh, coffee shop in the morning. you got six guys down here. Yeah, man, yeah, I mean, the buzz is going on. What are they talking about? They're talking about a high school sophomore football player who's got a sore toe. And then all of a sudden, you're becoming more rurally just because you're making a few contacts, logging it, looking it up in the book. So we can become worldly, sitting in our shack. All right. Uh, the next thing I would say is you get your QSL cards. I'm going to give these out if you don't have your cards yet. The important thing is the information on the card. I was at a mate. I had... 12 guys, I said, well, what's our entity? Nobody knew what our entity is, the United States of America. But there's 12 hams in the room, and not one of them knew. Uh, and the important thing about this is 
this box I got here. Funny, finally got that down. I would recommend you keep one side blank, all your information on the other side. The guy who gets your card should not have to look at both sides of your card to get the information. So that's an attitude of mine. Okay. Now I don't have to do my QSL. Now. So that takes care of the new guys or guys who have been around for a while and are just getting active and they forget all the stuff. So that's to remind them of that. So then we get into personal stuff. That would be me. And uh, 28 years ago, I was uh, going along and I, could ha I was having difficulty working Hawaii on 80 meters. And I decided I need a ground mounted vertical to work Hawaii on 80 meters. And I was at a ham store somewhere in southern New Jersey. Don't know who it was. I says, I'm looking for a ham, a, a vertical that'll go from what? He says, well, we went, we went back out into his uh, warehouse. He says, uh, yeah, how about the yeah, get, get that one over there. And I got the high gain DX88. Just serendipity. I bring that home and I can add 160 to it. So now we have the instructions on the vertical. So this is how fine a line and how important we are as an, M, as, as an Elmer to other folks. So right here it says, when the DX888 and the 160 call are installed on the ground, a radial system is normally required. The minimum recommendation is uh, for the radial system on 160 meters is on a city lot is 16 radials, 24 feet long, and 16 radials, 14 feet long. So that's 32 radials. Okay, that's the minimum. Now, in these two paragraphs here, the radial length of 24 feet on 4 megahertz will give you 3 dB below perfect ground or 120 radials. Then it goes, that's on poor ground. On good ground, it will give you 2 dB less than perfect ground, 120. Hmm, okay. So then you go down here. This is now on 160 meters. Ba ba ba. Poor ground, this system will give you 4 dB below perfect ground or 120. Again, with good radials, with good ground, it's only 3 dB less than perfect ground or 120. So now I'm into this thing for 15 minutes, and I hear perfect ground, 120, four times in two paragraphs. So now, hmm, how many radials should I use? <clears throat> Took me a half hour, yeah, 120. That's why I have 120. All right, so uh, that's the deal there. So now I'm going to read all the stuff that, uh, oh, by the way, here are the radials. You can buy them from, uh, this is four radials, number, it's about number 14, 14 feet long. And they sell you 16 of these. So you can go 16 and 16 and 16. Okay, and a yes. Radials, yeah. Somehow I had the idea you wanted a radial to be a quarter wavelength long. Clearly you're nowhere near a quarter wavelength long. Once you bury your radials, the resonance goes out the window. It's got nothing to do with anything. Because that's a good question, because if we're going to get trying to pound in, you'll understand. Okay? If, if, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you have your, your vertical antenna, say, 15 feet high, and it's an eight-band antenna, then you need two or three radials cut for each band. If it's buried... You don't have to worry about the length of the radials. Good question. So that's what they sell for radials. I think I'm supposed to carry on from here. Yes. So we learned a lot of stuff. 
what's the purpose of an antenna? What does it? I don't know what an antenna does. You ready for this? An antenna, a dipole, converts RF electric current to electromagnetic waves. That's what an antenna does. And the guy receiving receives the electromagnetic waves and converts it. And the conversion is when the antenna goes into the, the feed line. So when, when your energy comes up the feed line, The, the, the energy is going this way, the, and it cancels each other out. That's why the feed line doesn't, uh, doesn't brought it out. But once, once that energy comes out and the wire goes, it's the change of direction of the wire that changes the wire into a, an antenna. Only 45 years to find that out, all right? So that's the deal there. And so, I just want to make sure, the other thing, you see, I've, I did this 28 years ago, and I've had to defend this. This business is of decibel. This, this, these two paragraphs mention decibels eight times. What the heck's a decibel? Nobody knows it. Well, it's a big decibel and a little decibel. Got nothing to do with anything. One decibel, a just detectable change in signal strength, regardless of the actual value of the signal voltage. Well, you know, you're only going to get three decibels and uh, bye, 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 diminishing returns, you hear it all. If you go the extra mile so that you can improve the efficiency of your antenna system, which gives that guy in Tasmania a half a decibel or one decibel, it's enough whether you're going to make the contact enough. You don't need four decibels. If you can get one decibel, for, as far as he's concerned, you can make the contact. So one decibel is important. So that's the decibel deal. Are we ready? Now, I learned more stuff in the last 30 days. You got no friggin' idea. This is a dipole. Your transmitter is pumping wire juice up here and the electrons in the center coil and the center wire is going this way. And on the inside of the braid, the electrons are going that way. They both create a field, but they're in the opposite direction. So they can't, the electromagnetic waves that that creates is canceled out. And that's why your, uh, what you call it, why? Your, uh, what do you call this? Your, co your feed line theoretically doesn't transmit. Theoretically. When, yeah. So when they come out, one's going this way. And the stuff that's going that way is coming down this way. And so the energy is actually going this way along here. And it turns it into electromagnetic waves, 186,000 miles an hour, a second. And uh, that's how you work uh, Tasmania. I sailed on merchant vessels. I always brought a hunk of wire, always put up a dipole. Work the world with three or 25 watts. Now, see if I can do this. If we take the horizontal dipole, and hang it like that, we now have a vertical dipole, and I've used a, di a vertical dipole on a ship where from the bridge coming down, and this is just below the porthole, this comes in the porthole, and I've worked countless stations with a vertical dipole. Okay. Now, what we're here for is we take a vertical dipole and we bring the base down to the ground. The vertical dipole becomes a vertical monopole. Half your antenna is in the ground. So you automatically only have a half a dipole. 
you got a vertical dipole, six, eight feet and eight feet. You bring it down to the bottom. The bottom is totally consumed by the earth. And you get half the efficiency of a vertical dipole with the vertical monopole. And you're sitting down there and you're figuring this out, you're looking at this and wham! This appears. The baffling menagerie of issues. All of a sudden, you're dealing with hard soil, perfect ground, ground losses, ideal ground, system, near field, far field, antenna height, antenna length, all this crap that you don't have to worry about when you have a vertical dipole or a horizontal dipole. It's only when you put half the dipole in the ground, kapoof, this shows up. And this can overwhelm you. I mean, you can't figure out this. So everything, and what happens is, half your energy is consumed by the ground. Now, I got a sea story, a little sea story. Many years ago, I, I knew this woman. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> anyway, long story short, she marries the devil. She gives me a call once in a while, though. Don't worry about it. So I was talking to the devil's wife the other day. And we were talking about all the tools that the devil has that will interfere with our life. And periodically and sporadically, you know, a hanger, a rage, jealousy, you know, all this stuff that can disrupt us. But when we suffer from that stuff, we can act, maybe not correctly, but we can react to it. But the devil had a special tool, and I got it here. It's called the devil's wedge of discouragement. The difference with this, discouragement will make a grown man sit down and do nothing. So... She loaned it to me, providing I bring it back by midnight. The devil doesn't know I got it. So I'm going to pass around the devil's... Is this good, David? Excellent. All right, huh? <laughs> you know what it's going to be? Yeah. David knows. Oh, I had to tell David. <laughs> and this is the devil's wedge of discouragement. You're going to be able to hold it in your hand, look at it. And when you feel this discouragement coming in, you know what the frigate is. This is what's doing to you. And maybe you can overcome it. You ready? Look at it, feel it. This is the worn and battered wedge of discouragement. By the way, I didn't pay for it. There's a story behind that. So that is why nobody has 120 radials in the ground in northern New Jersey. Because of the de devil's wedge of discouragement. <laughs> if you wanted to get discouraged, try to imagine burying 120 friggin' radials in the backyard. You'll sit down and won't do it. That's it, right there. All right. I hope that makes it worthwhile. So you want the story on how I got that? Yeah. What's the big uh, ham fest, upstate New York? Sussex. Sussex. I'm walking around because I knew about the devil's wedge of discouragement, okay? And I see that and I said, wow, man, five dollars. Paid five dollars for it. So I'm telling the lady about the, the, the devil's wedge of discouragement. Wow. <laughs> she gave me the five dollars back. <laughs> so I still haven't paid for it. Oh, the devil doesn't know we have it. I got to bring it back to uh, the wife. So now we have, we take our vertical dipole, bring it down to the ground. It becomes a vertical monopole. The vertical monopole is one half a dipole. That's good. The monopole is always used in conjunction with a ground plane. 
which acts as a sort of electric mirror. So your ground plane, you have your antenna, and most of the power comes from close to the center of the antenna, which is the lower part, and bounces off and comes off the ground also at the bottom. Okay, so now we've got the purpose of a ground system. Reducing ground resistance, GR, is the purpose of the ground plane. The smaller we make the ground resistance, the more power will be radiated from the antenna. So the, all the radials and all this stuff is to reduce this ground resistance. That's the whole, that's the whole gig. Okay, so we know that. Now, why is that there? Now, yes. So, all right, you're improving antenna efficiency by adding wires. You're improving your ground, right? Well, so, we'll see. Well, okay. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got a monopole. So yes, sir? Opposed to a dipole. The difference in gain. I mean, you're losing half your power in the ground if you don't have a decent ground, right? Is That's a, correct. A 3 to 4 dB difference between a lousy ground and an excellent ground? The answer to the question is, you want a ground system that will improve your efficiency of the vertical monopole so that equals the dipole. Yes. That's it. You, but, can't, you can't get better than that. Right, right, but I mean, if the difference is just three or four dB. Now, three dB will make the difference in whether you uh, work California or not. Oh, all right, we didn't exactly answer the question. Okay. Is it just, is just a loss of three to four dB from a lousy ground to an excellent ground? People might argue, I'll, I'll give up. I know you're arguing the opposite. You want every dB, but I'm arguing the opposite from you, saying if it's only a 3 or 4 dB loss, maybe I don't want to dig up my yard. 3 dB is half. half well, that's... I understand. Yes, that's but that has dB. nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight. Oh. What I'm talking about is we want perfect ground. Then, and we're going to use 120. Can I use 60? Yes. Can I use 30 radials? Yes. Can you use 15? Yes. How many radials do you want to use? If Santa Claus came to your door and he says, I got, I got the elves out in the back, and they'll bury a ground system for you. Do you want 120, 60, 30, 15? How many, Santa Claus, how many, how many are you going to get from Santa Claus? What's the difference in the signal strength between 120? Well, you got to show up, you got to show up on time here. <laughs> Where the hell were you? <laughs> we just went through this, and I'm missing a part. So, the object is to create a perfect ground. And you know how you do that? With chicken wire. How much chicken wire? From here to 520 feet to 520 feet all the way around. Now, wait, when you say chicken wire... Is that galvanized or ungalvanized? There's chicken wire. Pass it around. <laughs> you think I come unprepared? <laughs> I got to talk about chicken wire. Don't bring chicken wire. At Was the, it worth it? At the risk of heckling, like well, John's question, I mean, that's going to rust if it's just regular. That's rust. why we don't use it. Oh. Okay. oh. <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying? You ready? You ready? Here's I found it. So the object is we want a perfect ground. A perfect ground can be simulated under a real antenna by installing a very large screen, chicken wire, on or near the ground surface of the ground. And a half wave long, 260 feet, 260 feet, okay? 120 radials at half, 
a wavelength long should equal almost what this chicken wire would do. So when we're building a, a, a radio system, we are trying to duplicate what the chicken wire will do. And if you look, the chicken wire, the object is, is tough to go through that without reflecting because the, the hole's only so small. Okay, we're gonna use the chicken wire. At uh, 160 meters, how much chicken wire do we need? <laughs> Area equals pi r squared. Now, you see, I gotta understand, I took algebra one and I flunked. I took algebra one in summer school and I flunked. I took algebra one against and I flunked. And Mr. Guy says, come here, Larry, come on. He says, I'm gonna give you a D minus, minus, minus. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So then I go to geometry class, 10 days. <laughs> Take wood chop. They kicked me out, put me in wood chop. <laughs> so I'm 78 years old. And this is the first time I used geometry. One, and I got it documented there. So here's the deal, guys. <laughs> pi times 260 times 260. Pi times 67,600 equals 220,000 uh, square feet. Divided by... David can. Don't you, don't you hate smart guys? <laughs> Here's a roll of chicken wire. How many square feet? 50 square feet. You need 4,247 of these, $63,000 worth of chicken wire. And that's steel. All right? Larry, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Okay. So we need 63,000... Square feet. Square feet of chicken wire. Oh, no, $63,000. $63,000 in chicken wire. Suppose... 4,000 of these. Four th Suppose, I said, well, that chicken wire is 18 gauge. You know, I, swear, I can get mason cloth, which is twice the diameter of chicken wire. Does the diameter... Oh, it's the, di it's the size of the holes that makes this valuable. The smaller the hole, the better it is. So if I got mason cloth, would be, be better, but cost you more. That's correct. Hundred thousand dollars. All right, Gavish. Huh? Was that worth doing it? I went down. I got the frame. I went down. <laughs> to, down a friggin'. Well, you know what? We'll make that the W two W A two A L Y. Award for anyone who puts down radials. Now, <laughs> and here's, so, well, this is, uh, 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 economics is a big factor. So a perfect ground, whether it be chicken wire or something else, we are trying uh, to create a perfect ground, and if we get a perfect ground, our vertical monopole will be as good as a dipole. Yeah, we'll, we'll go for that. Now, if you want 260 feet as a radial with number 10 wire is $15,000. 31,200 feet of 12, Number 12 is $10,000, and 31,000 feet at a, number 14 will be $7,800. That's still out of, out of range, okay? So we understand that. We have to be aware of that. Uh, perfect ground, perfect ground. So we did that. So we all square on that. The chicken wire is what you want. Can't afford the chicken wire, and it's not going to last. The next one is going to be with radial wires.